Okay, so now we have these uh, preceding protons and uh, we look at these protons in an xy plane. And I'm not sure whether I said that. Usually the z plane is, uh, the z direction is the long direction through my body and the xy plane, uh, or one xy plane would be something like this perpendicular to my to the long axis of my body. Okay, um, so uh, assume that this is my body. And uh, now we see these protons. And uh, of course, if we're, they're all um, oriented upwards. So that's perpendicular to my xy plane. They're proceeding like this. So if I would look at them like this, then they would be moving on circular paths. And um, yeah, that's uh, what we have now is we have a magnetic field that's quickly changing. Right, so uh, these are moving magnets, and moving magnets generate an alternating electric field, and probably that can be measured, and that's exactly what is done. So uh, these magnets um, produce a very small electric field outside of the body, and uh, that um, that field is measured. So what you do is you put up some coils over here, one coil in this direction, one coil in that direction, and they will measure the strength of the electric field in each of the two directions. They are uh, perpendicular, so uh, their measurements will be offset by pi over 2 if one proton um, um, produces um, an electric field that goes like e to the i omega t, and as usual, uh, I um, I assume that uh, the electric field in one direction is the real part of that and uh, the electric field in the other direction is uh, the imaginary part. Then what we can measure is actually the effect of one single proton that goes like e to the i omega t. And uh, of course that's for, uh, I measure the effect of all the protons. So what I measure in time is something like the contribution of each single proton so that the integral over R3 f of x e to the i omega t and probably that will somehow depend on the diff on the distance between the point where, where the field was generated and the measurement uh, um, the measurement point where we are taking where the coils are so it will be something like times one over x minus x, uh, uh, x bar squared dx. And of course, that e to the i omega t over here is independent of x, and I can just take it out. So more or less what I measure here is the integral over r3 f of x, one over x minus x bar squared dx. Okay, uh, where do we have that? Well, um, the f of x is now something, is now what we've actually been looking for. That's the proton density, right? Because uh, the every proton uh, uh, gives a contribution like this. And uh, of course, that's only produced inside of the patient. And um, of course, f of x is the point where, everything, where, where the um, field is generated for one proton and x bar is the measurement location of the coil away from the support of f so uh, this also this over here will never be zero in fact x bar is quite far away from x so uh, this will be very nice okay um now um taking your knowledge about computerized tomography and so on into account, you will immediately have an idea of how we can now use that. We'll move the coils around the patient and uh, we'll generate a lot of, um, of measurements and then we'll try to solve the inverse problem. Okay, uh, so what would, uh, would lo that look like? We have a measurement g of x bar. Since everything is independent of t, I can just drop the t. And what I can do, I can measure uh, the integral over R3, f of x, k of x, and x bar, dx, where k of x and x bar is the kernel of this integral equation. And it's something like one over x minus x bar squared. And remember, that's quite far away, so there's uh, no uh, singularity or something that's a very smooth function. 
Okay, uh, so definitely the kernel is in C infinity since X bar is away from the patient. So uh, when trying to solve the inverse problem um, and going uh, trying to reconstruct F given the measurements of G, this is an integral equation with a C infinity kernel. And that means that the recovery is ill post of order infinity or exponentially ill post. So quite frankly, this is just not going to work. And um, also, um, I mean, that's the mathematical reason. The true reason is that uh, just modeling the effect of one set of one um, point over here by one over x minus x bar is far too simple. Uh, and you have a lot of more, a lot more things going in here. And um, so, um, that it'll, it'll be very difficult to to try to to try something like that. Okay, so simply this is not going to work, and we need something else. And uh, the idea that I'll now be showing you is something that was devised by Lauterbuhr, I think, in the seventies. I think in the seventies, and uh, he got the Nobel Prize for this in 2003. Well, that's very late. Maybe it was in the 80s. And um, yeah, let's look at how this is done. And the main idea is uh, we want to make the Lama frequency dependent on the position in the body where we are. Currently, the uh, electric, the magnetic field, the outside magnetic field is constant everywhere. So the Lama frequency is constant everywhere. And uh, we want to make this dependent on the um, on space. And uh, that's going to be the main idea. OK, um, now, first of all, uh, I want to introduce the idea of a gradient magnetic field. And that simply means that uh, we have um, magnets, electromagnets that uh, are arranged in a special way. And um, they are arranged such that uh, the field strength that's generated by these magnets uh, increases in one direction. So we have the fixed, um, um, the fixed magnetic field B0. And on top of that, we apply several other fields. And the first one we apply is a gradient field in Z direction. So that means that the magnetic field is now decreasing or increasing, as you wish, in the Z direction. OK, uh, since uh, the Lama frequency uh, depends on the strength of the electric field in each point, the Lama frequency also now depends on Z and it's everywhere different. So uh, the Lama frequency decreases from bottom to top. Okay, uh, so uh, the uh, strength of the magnetic field, uh, which is now given as B of X, uh, Y, Z, and T, depends on Z and it's still constant with respect to X, Y, and T. And so that means that also the Lama frequency depends on X, Y, Z, and T, and depends on Z. OK, um, now what does that mean? Well, assume that the perpendicular push that we use to induce the rotation, the precession, has a constant, has a frequency, has a frequency omega 0. Uh, we already noted that uh, the push only has an effect when the Lama frequency is the same as the frequency of that push. So um, only protons where the Lama frequency matches the, um, the um, external frequency are affected by the push, right? All others just don't react. Think of the swing. So uh, since the Lama frequency changes with respect to the z-axis, there is only one xy plane through the body that is actually affected by that by the push. So this is no longer. Let me look at this. We modeled everything as an integral of r three f of x k of x and x bar dx, but now that push is only applied in one plane, 
So uh, um, only one plane is relevant for this one over here because the others just don't precess. So uh, the integral over R3 over here reduces to an integral over R2. Okay, that's nice. And now our new model is that g of t is given by the integral over r2 f of x, y, and z0, mu of x and y, so that's the attenuation that I had up there, and uh, times e to the i omega t dx dy. And uh, still, uh, I, I now make this dependent on t, but uh, since nothing over here depends on t, uh, this simply goes, it's, it's like a constant times e to the i omega t. Okay, um, now, um, and this would be an f over here. f is constant over time. This is our simple model for the time being. And uh, so, um, this is just nothing but e to the i omega t times a constant. Okay, now next idea. Um, let us assume, let's assume we have one proton and it's circulating as we modeled. So uh, it generates um, uh, an electric field uh, that um, is, an, so it's an uh, alternating current and the frequency is i to the omega naught times t. Okay, um, and, and that's all after the push. Okay, it's circulating. And now after the, after the push, we raise the magnetic field. We make it a little bit larger. What does that mean? Well, since the alarma frequency is now going up, the proton is moving faster. And then we go back to the original frequency and then it's going slower again. Okay, now assume that we're doing that for a very, very short time. Then what happens is everything is circulating, then it's uh, then we uh, switch on the uh, next um, uh, external magnetic field, so it moves faster for a, for a short time, and then we switch back, and so everything goes back to um, to normal. So uh, what does that mean? Well, um, the proton gets a little bit ahead. So uh, we have a phase difference, and uh, that phase difference will be um, will be um, um, more or less the, the time where we push on the, extra, the additional magnetic field and times the difference uh, between the, um, the, um, the field frequency or um, times the difference between the two Lama frequencies that we have. Right? Omega 1 should be the uh, Lama frequency for when we have an additional field and omega zero, uh, that's our normal uh, without the additional field. Okay, uh, so uh, the, um, that, uh, um, the uh, proton was previously circulating by, with, um, like e to the i omega naught times t. And after the push, it's again e to the i omega naught times t, but it's a little bit ahead. So it's uh, something like um, the, the phase difference. So it's ahead, something like gy times capital T, where t is the time where we push everything on. Okay, next idea. Now assume that this field is a gradient field which means that um, the, um, the amount uh, of, uh, of difference between omega uh, one and omega zero will now defend, depend on the y direction, on the y axis. Okay, um, sin since uh, if it's a gradient field in that direction, then uh, we have, um, then that means that the Lama frequency is, um, is um, also not constant, it's also um, uh, going up in one way. So it's, um, so the amount of phase difference, the amount that it goes forward will now depend on y. Okay, so uh, our new model is then that e to the i omega or, uh, i times omega naught times t plus the strength of the magnetic field that is now dependent on y, so that's uh, of the additional field, so that's y times gy times the t that we times t that we switched on the gradient, the external field. Okay, so uh, now that single proton is moving like this over here. Um, now, third idea, while we take the measurement, 
we apply an additional uh, after switching everything back again. So we are now in this position over here. Now we apply still another gradient in the x direction, which means, uh, and this time while we do the measurement. So um, that means that now at this time, uh, the omega north, which we have over here, is now varying in the x direction. So it depends on the x direction. And uh, it will be something like omega zero, the original lama frequency, and then it will go up in the x direction. So it's something like omega zero plus, plus x times gx, uh, where gx is the strength of the additional field that we put in. Okay, uh, that is the new lama frequency. So uh, times t, this is what comes up. And we already had this y times gy times capital T. Okay. Now let's plug this in. Uh, we had that g of t is the integral over r2, f of x, y, and z0. So the z0, the plane that we selected using uh, the uh, gradient field in the z direction, times some attenuation function, times, well, every single, um, every single um, proton now rotates like e to the i omega zero plus x times gx times t plus y times gy times capital T. Okay, so let me plug this in and not forget about the dx dy. Oops. And here as well. Okay, so I have this over here. But now, of course, I see, I see that e to the i omega naught times t is something that I can take out here. And also from the rest over here, well, I see that this is more or less a Fourier transform. So um, I do that, I take the e to the i omega t over, I add it to pi to the minus one. And then this is exactly the same as the integral of r2 f of x, y, and z naught. Uh, mu of x and y, uh, e to the i x times gx plus uh, times t plus y times gy times capital T dx dy. And pulling everything over, this is e to the minus i omega zero t over two pi times g of t. And g of t is my time dependent measurement. Okay, but looking at this, uh, and I think I forgot something over here again. Uh, this is nothing but the Fourier transform of f times mu, but mu is more or less constant, so I left it out here. The Fourier transform of f with, uh, um, with respect to the first two coordinates at the point gx times t, uh, gx times small t, and gy times capital T. So what we're finally getting is what we're directly measuring over here is the Fourier transform, the two-dimensional Fourier transform of the function f. So that's interesting. So we can directly measure the Fourier transform. And uh, also what you see is uh, if we just let this run, if we just measure for a short time, then what we get is the Fourier transform on a line through the frequency space. Okay, that's nice. So uh, we just take the inverse Fourier transform, two-dimensional inverse Fourier transform, and we got F. Okay, so uh, that was very simple, and it actually is. That's what really happens. And uh, now the question is, is that an L post problem? Of course it is not, um, because by pass of all, we have that the norm of f and the norm of f hat are the same, the L2 norm are the same. So uh, the uh, operator norm of the Fourier transform is one, like for its inverse. And uh, that means it's not only well posed, it's probably one of the best posed problems you can have. Okay, uh, so that seems to be not very interesting in uh, this lecture on inverse problems, but uh, nevertheless, it turns out that typically these data is undersampled, so uniqueness is not given, 
and still one of the um, one of the um, um, one of the three conditions of Hadamard three condition is violated. And um, also uh, many questions that arise in the radon transform, like what are optimal measurement geometries? In this case, that would mean how can we optimally select the lines that we measure on, and they even don't have to be lines. Um, how can we do that? And uh, that's definitely something that's, uh, that was also part of our lecture. Okay. Um, let me show you that there is one maybe a little bit uh, surprising uh, connection between the Fourier tran or between MRI and the co and computerized tomography. Um, in in the first um, tomographs, um, MR, um, magnetic resonance tomographs that were devised, um, the lines that were measured all went through the origin. So what was measured was something like f hat of sigma k times theta l. And um, now this is something that is very well known for, to us. Um, Fourier slice tells us that uh, this is exactly the same as rf hat of theta l and sigma k. And now we can really, once for once, really make use of Fourier slice. Um, because just taking the inverse Fourier transform with respect to sigma k, which is simple, which is simple because the sigma k are equispaced in are equispaced, we get uh, the radon transform. We can compute the radon transform of f uh, in directions theta k with uh, equispaced s k. Uh, l that should be yeah theta L and SK. And that means uh, if we choose everything nicely, then we have a true parallel geometry, something that will not even true for the computerized tomography. And of course, we can now generate our images by filter back projection. And it turns out that this is the easiest way of doing the inverse Fourier transform here, because if you have a geometry like this, uh, fast Fourier transform is not easily going to work. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, filter back projection is something that's very simple uh, that we can do very efficiently. We proved everything for that. And so that's why in these cases, this is actually used. Okay, uh, and I think Lauterbohr actually used it to produce his images. Um, this was a, a very, very short, much too short introduction to MRI. Um, the MRI has a, a giant impact uh, in, uh, in medical imaging, and it's probably, probably the uh, most attractive um, imaging device, also because it's not using radioactivity like, um, um, like CT, X-rays, and, um, uh, <laughs> and emission tomography. And uh, so that's one of the reasons why uh, it's, it's very widely used. A disadvantage is uh, that, uh, as you saw here, uh, the, um, the um, measurements have to be done line by line. And uh, so that can take quite some time. Also, you get only uh, the measurements in one uh, uh, one plane, just as I, uh, at least in the uh, way I presented everything here. So typically, if you take, a th if you want to visualize a 3D volume, then uh, it takes quite a lot of time. It's really quite long, can easily take something like 20, 25, 30 minutes. And um, also the last thing is these things, if you've ever been to one, uh, these things are extremely loud and uh, people who are suffering um, often can just cannot stand that and that may be a real problem. Also, let me at least mention that there are some people who believe that uh, exposing a human body to a three Tesla magnet, magnet cannot be really healthy. Um, I don't know whether this is true, but uh, anyway, that's one of the reasons why the other, maybe one of the reasons why the others still exist. And of course, MRI is quite expensive and CT is unbelievably cheap. 
Okay, uh, but we will stick with the idea that we want to get rid of um, of uh, nuclear of radioactivity, and that's why we're going to look at ultrasound and light as a medium.